Like many of you, we have been decluttering our house throughout the pandemic. Uh, we're trying to get rid of the excess, and we are trying to retain what is essential in our home. And it's amazing how things just came, seem to expand over the years. This idea of decluttering is important physically and in our homes and closets and all those sorts of things, but it's also important in the whole world of ideas, to declutter ideas. The ability to summarize, boil things down, get to the bottom line is a rare gift. It helps to cut through all the confusion and get to the heart of a matter. And Jesus, as we're going to see, he was able to get rid of excess and to retain what was essential. And there's so many ideas in our culture that are clamoring for attention. You're probably at times overwhelmed with all the information and all the ideologies and philosophies and all the things going on in our world and social issues and how to get through them all. How can we turn down the noise and tune into the most important messages? So Jesus is going to answer one of life's greatest questions and help us to focus on what is most essential. I'm sure you're familiar with this passage in Mark chapter 12. And uh, Jesus was asked a question, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all of your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Most important question. And Jesus is going to boil it down, get down to the essentials here for us. Notice that it is a command. In verse 20, it is a command that is given to us. It's from God. It's essential. It's not something that's up for debate. It is Extremely important. It requires our faith and our obedience. The Jews of Jesus' time, they had counted up about 613 various laws. Uh, some of them are negative. Some of them are positive in the Old Testament law. And then they added on a whole lot of other oral traditions to keep from breaking the law, breaking any of the 613 laws. And this was a common thing the rabbis would do, is to discuss which laws were important and weighty and which ones were less important, a little lighter and not as significant. And the question was, what is the first? What is the primary command? What is the most important? Boil things down to essentials. Summarize. Get to the bottom line. What is foundational? And then Jesus answered this from this great text in Deuteronomy chapter 6, what's known as the Shema, which is basically the first words of the, of the uh, sentence in the Hebrew, Shema, hear, hear, O Israel, listen. And it's talking about love. And this is not an emotional love, but a covenant love, being loyal and faithful to God. And in, in Jesus, the words that were recorded in, in the New Testament is talking about agape kind of love, a, a decision to do what was best for another person, to love God wholly with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Heart being the seat of the, of the mind, the soul being the whole being, the, uh, the mind, Jesus adds this, is actually not in the Old Testament text, but it's inherent in the whole text, and your strength, because it was to involve the whole person. We were to love God wholly, completely. And then he goes on to say, love your neighbor as yourself. It wasn't actually part of the original question, but Jesus added it because it is inseparably linked. You can't love uh, you're, you have to love your neighbor as yourself. There's no two greater commands than these. You can't love God and then hate people who are made in his image. And likewise, you can't just love people without properly loving God. And so much in our society is just love is just a feeling, it's a sentiment, it comes and goes, but we need to have our love founded upon who God is, the very nature and character of God. And these provide the foundation for all the other commandments. All the others grow out of them. And therefore, they are the most important of all. And that's how Jesus dealt with the excess to retain the essential. And now I want to call a timeout in my sermon. Okay? I missed something in the text. And I purposely messed up my message. So those of you who are my Bible scholars, what did I miss? Come on, those of you who are in my classes, nobody's going to venture anything? You're all being shy this morning? 
Did I talk about the context of these verses? I didn't. I completely bypassed the context. Is context significant? Absolutely. Context changes everything. As I went through this passage, I know most of you can quote this flawlessly. How many of you are not familiar with the two great commandments, right? Like most of you can quote this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Like John 3.16, we can quote it because we know it. But the tragedy is this key Bible text can appear dry and theoretical when considered apart from its context. These truths were not delivered in a vacuum. They were packaged in a story for a reason. All right? I always go over this with all of my classes when we talk about this. I believe there is only one interpretation to any given passage of Scripture. We can debate that a little bit, but there's basically one interpretation of a passage of Scripture. There are many, many, many different applications of it, okay? Many applications. How do you determine that? Well, always, number one, context. Context is king. Those of you who are my Bible scholars, you know that. And secondly, the second thing is, what did the original author intend his original audience to know, be, or do? What was the intent of the author writing what he wrote. And that narrows everything down. And you hear often, well, there's so many different interpretations of the Bible, I don't know who to believe. Well, the problem is people haven't looked at the context and they haven't considered what the original author intended. And so that's why we have to do the background studies in the ancient cultures in which the Bible was written. We are going to have a hard time understanding the Scriptures if we don't understand what's going on in the days of the Bible. And when we do that, suddenly the text starts to come alive, and we start to gain insight into what's going on. So returning to our text, what was the context for these two greatest commands? And when we examine the context, this text explodes, literally explodes with dynamic human drama in what was going on at that time. And so instead of lifeless theories, it comes alive with truly the power to transform our lives. And so I'm going to restart my message. And we're going to start from the beginning again. I'm going to change the metaphor a little bit. And we will be out of here. I will use up my 30 allotted minutes. We won't go beyond. I'm watching the clock. Uh, But I want to show you the context here and why it's so important. So let's go back to the text and read it here. Starting at verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them, the Sadducees and Jesus, disputing with one another. And seeing that he considered them, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all of your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. I want to talk to you a little bit about riptides. Riptides, rip currents, undertows are wave forces that go along beaches in the ocean, the open ocean. And these are forces that can pull people away from the safe, shallow waters and move them towards the dangerous de- uh, depths. In the U.S., uh, about 100 swimmers a year drown due to rip currents, and about 30,000 people have to be rescued by lifeguards to bring them back to, to shore. These currents don't actually drown people, they just exhaust people and they end up drowning trying to fight against them. Likewise, this world has a forceful, riptide like effect upon all people that seeks to drag people away from the safety of the shore out into the dangerous depths where predators lurk. Another term for this could be peer pressure. 
pressures being put on us by our culture to conform and to go in the way that the world wants us to go. And people try in their vein to fight against these forces, but they end up becoming exhausted and drowning. And in the end, many can't resist the pull. We need to be aware of these dangerous cultural things that are going on around us so that we can fight against them and escape their grip. And in our text, we're going to witness a dramatic interaction between a questioner, there's going to be a question, there's going to be a quest, and lastly, a conquest. I love it when an outline comes together really nicely. <laughs> but it works. But we're going to see that actually right in the text. So what prompted this whole dramatic uh, encounter. Notice again who asked the question. Always important, important. What's going on in the text? And we find here, remember in the whole flow of Mark's gospel, Mark is creating a case. There's a whole storyline that he's conveying. And here we come to, uh, uh, during Jesus' Passion Week, a whole bunch of uh, confrontations between the religious leaders. And it's a series of confrontations all during this last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. These are dramatic. These are intense conflicts. And I, last week, we, res, we, made it, um, we resembled it to or compared it to a high-stakes chess match with bold moves and strategic counter moves that were taking place. At stake were life and death issues with eternal consequences. And remember again, Jesus last week in the chess match was, was um, uh, confronted by the Sadducees with an unanswerable question. And Jesus checkmated them with the very scriptures that they held to be authoritative. But notice now, out of this, verse 28, that a questioner shows up. Who was he? He was one of them. He was one of the bad guys. He was one of the scribes. He was one of the religious leaders. Uh, he's one out of many. Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, called him a lawyer. So he would know the law and would be able to interpret it for people. He appears to be a Pharisee. If you go back to Matthew's gospel, uh, Matthew chapter 22, he remains nameless. We do not know his name in the whole story. But he was an eyewitness of this chess match. He had watched going back and forth, and particularly as a Pharisee, he would be paying attention because this question of the Sadducees was the one that they always threw at the Pharisees to frustrate them and get them upset. And he noticed, the scribe noticed, he perceived, he saw that Jesus answered the Sadducees well, appropriately. He gave a good answer. Jesus had answered the unanswerable question. And he was impressed. Wow, Jesus answered the unanswerable question. The Sadducees were incensed, but he was impressed by what was going on. Jesus had completely exposed everything the Sadducees believed and had wiped out their faulty, flawed worldview. The lesson here we gain from this is look for open hearts. Jesus was surrounded by a whole bunch of hard-hearted people, closed minds. And suddenly we see that there's one, just one, in the crowd there who had an open heart. The Sadducees, instead of repenting, hardened their hearts and ended up basically smashing the chess set and crucifying Jesus a few days later. But here we find that there's a sometimes, and hopefully, and we pray towards, that there'll be a few, even if it's just one, who will pay attention. A couple weeks ago, we had VBS. One of the stories was the shepherd who left the 99 who wouldn't repent and went after the one who, who would repent. That's important to God. Pray and look for those open-hearted people. Well, how do we know that this scribe had an open heart? Look at the nature of his question in verse uh, 28. The nature of his question uh, there, which commandment is the most important of all? And then Jesus goes on to answer it. Here's the, here's the question. What's the greatest commandment of all? We've just touched at the beginning of my message on the theory. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. But notice how Jesus responded. Typical rabbis, if you gave him a question, he would respond with a question. Right? That was kind of the typical rabbinic way of dealing with things. But Jesus didn't answer his question with a question. 
He knew this was a legitimate question. He knew this guy was actually searching for, he had an open heart. So Jesus answered it. He, uh, the question was not asked with hostility. It wasn't to entrap him. It wasn't to deceive him. It wasn't to humiliate him publicly. It was a great question. What is the most fundamental question of all? And so Jesus answered it. Love God and love people. It doesn't get any more basic or foundational or essential than that. Get rid of the excess. Retain the essential. It's more than a feeling. This is what our world does not understand about love. Love is not primarily a feeling. It may involve feelings, or there's parts of that, but love is basically a decision to do what is best and right for another person in the sight of God. Always is a decision of the will to do what is right. It it's literally says out of the whole heart, from or out of the whole heart. I know it says all your heart, all your soul, mind, and strength, but it has the idea of from a whole heart. All of these things are intertwined. They all overlap. In other words, God wants us to love him wholly, completely, in every aspect of our being. And then to love our neighbors also, to do uh, that agape, to decide to do what is best for other people. Those of you who are married, we know that if we just depend upon romantic love to keep our relationship strong, we're going to have problems. We're going to have issues. There are times when we are going to struggle in our dynamics of our relationship, but we need to know there's a bedrock commitment to keep working through the issues. It is agape, choosing to do what is right. And we need to worship God according to how he has revealed himself. That's why that little preamble is important. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Why is that in there? Because it's saying we need to worship God for who he has revealed himself to be, not to worship him as I want him to be. And this is the problem with our world. People want a spirituality or people want to worship God, but they want God to kind of fit into their mold, to be the way that they want him to be, and to fit their, uh, their image of what God should most, is supposed to be. But this is important to understand that God has to be worshipped for who he is who he is. I have no right, I have no authority to change God into my image. I am to reflect his. But the point is you can't love God and you can't hate others and vice versa. We need to worship, love others out of our love for God. The point is priorities, prioritize God's priorities. God has certain priorities and he wants those to be first. He wants those to be essential he wants those to be foundational for us. Work on loving God with your whole being. Choose to do what is honoring to him. He's not looking for half-hearted. He's looking for wholehearted, all of us, to be worshiping and loving him. Work on loving others. All those you encounter, choose to do what is best for others. In Luke's gospel, this story is told in conjunction with the, with the Good Samaritan. Who is my neighbor? Anybody I come across in terms uh, who has a need. And when we get to the end of the story, I think we're going to see even more clearly what it means to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. We'll get there in a moment. So, here's where this story, I believe, takes a dramatic turn, an amazing turn here. The quest in verses 32 through 34. Notice that. The scribe said to Jesus, You are right, teacher, You have truly said, and he repeats all of this. And notice down in verse 33, to love one's neighbor as yourself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Here's his quest. Notice his humility. He actually says, you are right. Remember the context. He's surrounded with all his religious leader buddies. And he says to Jesus, you are right. And you know what all of his buddies did? (gasps) No. Right? You are right. He calls him teacher. The Sadducees had called him teacher in verse 19, but they were sneering when they said it. He seems to say it genuinely. Teacher, respectfully. Uh, 
And he agreed that God should be worshipped as, as he has revealed himself, for God is unified and he is unique. He is special. He is other. He is holy. And notice his perception. He requoted both Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as yourself. He agreed with God's priorities. He got it. He said it was the greatest command. But then he went one step further. Did you notice? Loving God and loving others is much more than, or even more than, whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. What? Are you serious? Like, again, all of his buddies are listening to this going, what, what's going on here? And this is where the riptide kicks in. This is where the rip current shows up. This is where the undertow, these forces that want to pull people away from the safety of shore out into the deep, suddenly starts to come into play. This comment was stated in public with crowds and religious leaders all around them. This took place in the temple. You could smell the whole burnt offerings in the air. That's where this took place. You could smell it. And the other religious leaders would be staring at him saying, dude, what's wrong with you? Are you serious? His comment was inflammatory. They would have considered this heresy and high treason. And the riptide of the scribe's culture would try to draw him back out to sea and away from the safety of the shore. This scribe was a rogue among the religious. He's gone rogue. He's going the wrong direction. He's turned around. He's not going where everybody else is going. And he understood suddenly that the religious ritual is meaningless apart from a loving relationship with God that translates into loving others. That's how you know you really love God, is you love others. Empty rules, regulations, rituals, religious performances is utterly meaningless and useless apart from a relationship with God. And he was going the wrong way. He was rogue. He was a compromiser. He was a traitor. He was going upstream against a downstream culture. He was going uphill rather than going downhill with the crowd. And this would have taken enormous courage, enormous determination, enormous perseverance to keep going. He was on a quest to resist the riptide and land safely on the beach where Jesus was standing, to identify with Jesus. This was radical. This was different. This was scary for all those watching. And this is exactly what the process of repentance looks like. This is what it looks like. Going the wrong direction and suddenly going, wait a second, if I keep going this direction, it's a dead end. It, it, it's, it's death. It's darkness. It's, it's not life. And I've got to reverse course. I have to change directions. And I need to go in a different direction. I need to go this way instead of away from God towards God. And this is what Jesus is calling each of us to do. Challenging us. Don't get swept out to sea. Don't get swept out to sea by the riptide of the world's culture or by attempting to save yourself through religious performance. You will just exhaust yourself and you will drown. You need to get turned back to Jesus. The application is become a rogue amongst the religious. Be a rogue. If you really want to understand what it means to follow Jesus, then you need to understand what this scribe is experiencing and what he's going through. The scribe was not dismissing or disrespecting the law. He simply understood that it was actually pointing to a relationship with God that superseded just mere religious exercise without God. And he was on a quest to find God. The neat thing is, as it turns out, God was already on a quest to find him. Listen to Jesus' commendation in verse uh, 34. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, perceptively, he was under the pieces were all starting to come together in this man's mind. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Literally in the text, in the, in the original language, it is 
Um, not far you are from the kingdom of God. Kind of sounds like Yoda in Star Wars. But, but that's literally, it's, it's up front in the sentence to emphasize, not far, not far you are from the kingdom of God is Jesus' comment. And I believe that this is the dramatic moment in the story. He suddenly was getting it. It was suddenly starting to make sense. He started to understand. Jesus looked him straight in the eye and said, not far you are from the kingdom of God. What a powerful, poignant moment in this whole story. He's basically saying this, dude, you're this close. You're on the right track. Keep going. Don't give up. You're you're starting to get it. Keep going in that direction. The others were far. He was not far. They were going in the wrong direction. He was fighting the riptide and going in the right direction. Others were in the rips, rips, uh, riptide and drifting out to sea to drown in their pride and self-righteousness. And this scribe was fighting the prevailing current and heading for shore. And so should we. And so should we. Various riptides try to carry us out. We need to be careful. We need to fight the current, turn around, and swim in his direction. And what was the final result here? The conquest. Everybody stopped asking Jesus questions. <laughs> no more questions. He had silenced them. There was nothing more that they could say. He had answered everything. The religious leaders ended up just smashing the chessboard and crucifying Jesus a few days later. But he had checkmated them. And there was no more answers and nothing more. And they had seen one of their own start to turn towards him. And they were incensed. But a few, a few didn't go along with the riptide of the culture. Such as this scribe. He was a rogue amongst the religious. But there's also others. Every so often we see little glimpses through the New Testament. There was a gentleman by the name of Nicodemus. Do you remember him? In John 3? He started to get it. Asking questions, not sure, but... We see him a couple of times in John's gospel processing things and putting all the pieces together. And I'm sure many of you are still doing the same thing, trying to fit all the pieces together. You've got bits and pieces, trying to put it all together and understand this call of Jesus on your life. There was another gentleman by the name of Joseph of our Arimathea, and he seemed to get it, or at least was on the process as well. And there's a neat little verse in Acts chapter 6, verse 7 that says many of the priests turned to the faith. This is after Jesus' time. But little glimpses, some of them started to get it and started to turn and started to repent and see that everything was falling into place. Oh, and there was another guy. You may have heard of him before. Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee. And Jesus literally had to knock him upside his head, knock him off a horse, to get him to suddenly fit. Who are you, Lord? And to get all the pieces to come together. That's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to help us understand. Don't go with the riptide. Go towards him. Look for open hearts. Be an open heart. Have an open mind. Understand who Jesus is and how he has revealed himself. Prioritize God's priorities And don't get into just the religious performance, but it has to be something real for whole life, whole heart for him. And become a rogue among the religious. Sometimes you have to go against the flow in order to follow Jesus. As I close, I want you to picture in your mind uh, sunbathers and beachgoers on a beautiful, beautiful beach. Maybe in the south, I don't know, somewhere. Maybe we're Sega, someplace beautiful, sun's out. Some are floating on inner tubes in the waves, blissfully unaware of a dangerous rip current that is slowly dragging them out to deep waters. And in the deep waters lurk the sharks. So it wouldn't be with Sega, it would be the Caribbean um, or someplace else. Uh, and uh, that's where the orca are, and all these dangerous predators that are out in the dark. And then I want you to picture Jesus with a rope in his hand, spinning it like a lasso over his head and throwing it out, throwing it out, casting it out into the waters. And many people are fearing, saying, well, he's out to ensnare me. He's out to capture me. He wants to restrain me. He's aiming for my head, go around my neck to strangle me. The truth is he's trying to throw it out to capture all of us, heart, soul, mind, and strength around 
around the middle to bring us safely back to shore. It's actually a lifeline, a life rope, not aiming for our heads, but aiming for our hearts, our souls, our minds, our strength, because he wants to pull us back to shore. And when we get to shore, he passes us a lifeline lasso as well and asks us to do the same thing, to get the lasso and throw it out there because there are others who are drowning out there, caught in a dangerous riptide, and they also need to be brought safely to shore. This is what it looks like to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. To resist the the riptide and go towards Jesus Whatever that looks like, do it in partnership with us as a church family. Do it with us, and we do it together, but going after Jesus with a whole heart. And then what has he called us to do? Our mission is to share that message with others, to throw the lifeline lasso to others, to bring them to God. Fight the riptide by fleeing to Jesus. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for your word this morning, for these wonderful commands that give us guidance in life, boils everything down to the essentials, loving you with our whole selves and loving our neighbors as ourselves. But Father, we just see this beautiful, beautiful story of a scribe who is beginning to get it. We don't know the end of the story. I like to believe that he did trust you. He's maybe one of those priests in Acts 6 who trusted you and went on in the faith. Father, help us to resist the riptide. Help us to take hold of the lifeline, to go come closer to Jesus. Help us to have the courage and determination to do that. And for any who are struggling, trying to put all the pieces together, we pray that you would enlighten them, that you would help them to have open hearts and open minds so they might trust, trust Christ today. We bless you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.